screen I'm sharing. Yep. Yeah, good. All right, and we are live. Hi all, welcome to Amelia McNamara's USR 2020 keynote session. You can follow us on Twitter at USR 2020 St. Louis and use hashtag USR 2020 in your tweets. Today's session is planned as followed. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Tatiana Katsievich. I am a data scientist, amongst many other things, and of course, I'm a big fan of R. I did my PhD in statistics at Manchester University, and I lived for many years in Manchester and worked in academia where we lived in the UK. I escaped academic life about three years ago and founded a number of initiatives devoted to developing data-driven communities. Last year, I set up Sister Analyst, which is an NGO aiming to empower women from a diverse range of backgrounds through a range of educational programs. I have pleasure to introduce you to Amelia. Uh, for those who don't know Amelia, Amelia is uh, McNamara, is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer and Information Sciences at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. Amongst many of her achievements, she received her PhD in statistics from UCLA and is now an assistant professor at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul's, Minnesota. She teaches in the Department of Computer and Information Sciences and her research lies at the intersection of statistics education and statistical computing with the goal of making it easier for everyone to learn and do statistics. Amelia has been involved in the development of R packages such as Mobilize R for high school students learning data science and Scheme R for useful and tidy summary statistics. But before we hear from Amelia, I want to turn over to Joe Rickett for, from our lead sponsor, R Studio, who will be speaking briefly. So without further ado, over to you, Joe. Hello, everyone. Um... I'm very happy to be here. And uh, indeed, our studio is um, very pleased that we're enabled to be a sponsor um, for this conference. So I hope uh, you can all see my slides. And, um, and I wanna say just a few words about what we're up to here at our studio. Um, so first off, um, let me start with the mission statement and, and I'll read this part to you. Um, our mission is to create free and open source software for data science, scientific research and technical communication. Okay, this is a, a pretty lofty goal for a small company, but this is the kind of thing I think it's necessary to have in front of you every day um, to get up in the morning and go to work, something that's meaningful. And, and this is the kind of thing that our studio management is totally committed to. So underneath that, um, let's talk some particulars. So right in the middle, you see 50%. We spend uh, 50, approximately 50% 50 of all of our engineering cycles are devoted to open source software. So as you know, we have a number of teams doing this. And uh, I'll show you some of the packages that we've been involved in uh, later on. Uh, to do this, on the right hand, you see sustainable investment. So our business model is probably unique. Uh, we have, um, we sell, of course, professional products aimed at enhancing um, the ability of data science teams in large enterprises and we use the proceeds from that mostly to fund our open source work. Now on the right, you see be certified and this I wanna spend a few moments on. So our studio is now a public benefit corporation. What this means is that, you know, we have PBC after our studio rather than INC. So this means that we have um, a corporation that has special legal status. Uh, in particular, it enables uh, uh, management to be somewhat free from the constraints that have that bind um, 
corporations in the sense that um, we have more people to answer to than just the shareholders. So if you follow a little bit of the United States history since the days of the robber barons in the early 20th century, um, legal uh, rulings have progressively uh, limited the amount of um, freedom that managers and companies in the United States have towards um, considering stakeholders other than shareholders. And let me give you an example. Uh, this is an article that uh, appeared recently in the New York Times. And it talks about the difference between the jobless rate in the United States and, um, and Japan. And it notes, I show you some quotes here that you could read, that um, companies in Japan are more likely than their American counterparts to prioritize employees' interest over those of shareholders, focusing on the sustainability of their business rather than maximizing growth. So this is what I'm talking about. It's difficult for US companies to do that. And that's why we've sought this public benefit corporation so that we can operate in a manner that's not exclusively uh, making us answer to shareholders. You can also see in, um, in the slide, be certified. There's a, an independent uh, nonprofit organization that actually um, gives out certification certificates for which we have applied and received. And, and every year they report on the progress of how well we're doing towards meeting our goals. So if you're interested in that, you can follow, you can follow us on the website and there are some links at the end of this presentation. So what, what's engaging us this year is I think what's engaging everyone. There, there's a, uh, we have this pandemic and we have a lot of civil unrest in the United States. So as far as the pandemic goes, you may have seen this from the R Studio blog post by Hadley Wickham uh, earlier in the year. And we wanna make sure that if we can help serious efforts to fight the COVID-19 virus, we will do what we can towards allocating our studio um, resources. So you see here are some specific order, uh, offers. And if you're in that situation and our studio can help, please reach out and contact us. Uh, this is an example of um, a dashboard, a shiny base dashboard that uh, was recently launched by the state of California. And it's just an example of um, the tremendous work that the R community is doing really. I mean, um, there are data scientists and, and R developers and programmers all around the world who are contributing significantly uh, to fighting the, the COVID challenge. And we're happy to have a small part in helping with the tools to be able to um, uh, to make this work happen. So this is, um, this is something that, um, you know, we're just very proud of the way the R community has responded to this. If you visited the R Studio website, you may have also seen this, that we made a strong uh, commitment to um, Black Lives Matter. It's a strong statement. And there's a way you can go and donate to um, the charities of your choice. So we're, we're very proud to have the ability to, to make a small window into um, helping people make a commitment to making change here. Here's some of the packages that we are, when I checked recently on um, the 2nd of July, these are the packages that have our studio's uh, name in the author uh, slot in some part. And um, it just, it's, it's pretty impressive, and, but it's, it's only a fraction of the work that our studio is trying to move along in open source. And again, it reflects so well on the community to provide, none of these packages exist without the community's help and infrastructure and the ability to move forward in, in helping statistical computing progress. This slide, um, just gives an idea of what the professional products are. So the way I think of it is that we are building um, products to assist 
professional teams who have to make, uh, you know, do data science work in integrated platforms that involve just a lot of different technology. So we're doing our best to provide uh, tools that corporations can use um, to facilitate the, the flow of information and, and to make data science um, products and artifacts easy. And of course, our studio is, um, continues to support the R Consortium. And for this, I am, uh, I'm very pleased and I'm, I'm happy to do my part as um, a member of the R Consortium Board of Directors. And that's what I have to say. If I can help be helpful to anybody, please uh, reach out to me directly. And um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to. All right. Um, well, uh, hopefully you can see my slides um, and, uh, and you can hear me. That's always the danger with doing these virtual keynotes. Um, but like Tatiana said, I'm Amelia McNamara. Um, I am an assistant professor at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, and I tweet at Amelia MN, which is a double entendre because my last name is McNamara and I live in Minnesota. And I just tweeted a link to my slides. So if you want to follow along, they're hosted on my website uh, and you can, you can see them maybe more easily there. So even though I teach in the uh, Department of Computer and Information Sciences, I am actually a statistics professor and really I teach a lot of R. I've taught thousands of people to program in R over the years from high school students, high school teachers, college students, lots and lots of college students, data science professors, fellow uh, professional statisticians, and many more people. So I'm really interested in how we can improve uh, the teaching um, and learning of And before I really get into my talk, um, I'd like to take a moment and do a land acknowledgement. So even though we're at a virtual conference, um, I would like us all to just take a moment and think about the physical space that we're each occupying and the history of that space. So in the United States, uh, almost all of our land um, was forcibly taken from Native Americans. And the place where I'm currently physically located is no different. So uh, the Twin Cities, now known as Minneapolis and St. Paul, were originally Dakota land. And we really have a vibrant Dakota um, and Native community here to this day. So I chose this beautiful map of sites uh, in the Twin Cities, which is labeled in the Dakota language um, to help ground my talk. Uh, and the idea of language is one that I'm going to take into my talk. So um, the big ideas from my talk are about the idea of code as language. So because I've taught so many people to program in R, I'm interested in how we can help teach people. Um, and I think that we can take lessons from other types of uh, teaching and learning, such as the teaching and learning of human language. And I think that the things that we um, do to make it easier for novices to get started are also things that are going to make it easier for everyone, including experts who are using R. So I have a bunch of big ideas, which we're going to come back to again and again throughout my talk, um, like code as language, uh, the importance of consistency, the idea of speakable or verbalizable code, um, and, and maybe a need for um, maybe some more consistency within our community. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about R code um, and making comparisons to human language. And like many languages, R has different dialects. So one of the powers of R is that you can implement your own domain specific language or what I'm kind of calling a syntax here, which is like a dialect in a human language. So if you were learning human language, um, you probably would not try to learn multiple dialects at once, you would stick to one. Um, and people who have taught R have found that that is the way to make it easier for people to learn is if you're very consistent with the syntax that you stick to. So I developed this syntax cheat sheet 
sheet for my students. Um, I have taught courses entirely in each of these syntaxes that are shown as columns in my cheat sheet. Uh, the dollar sign syntax is what I'm calling the sort of standard base R syntax. There's also formula syntax and tidyverse syntax. And while I try to stay within one column when I'm teaching, students usually go out and Google code and it's useful for them to be able to see, oh, here's how we could do this parallel task in a different syntax and be able to sort of identify it when they see it. Um, when I show this cheat sheet, I often get questions and comments about data.table, um, which is not on here, mostly because I'm not an expert in data table. Um, and I really don't know how to do visualizations or summary statistics. You know, there's sort of these sets of tasks that I have done in each of the three syntaxes, and I just don't know how to do those in data table. So if you know and you want to send them to me, I'd love to see them. Um, and here's just like a closer look at some of the tasks. So doing summary statistics for one variable or for two variables. Um, and again, uh, usually when I'm teaching, I'm trying to be very consistent within one of the columns. Of course, practitioners are really mixing and matching the syntaxes that are shown here uh, when they're working. But um, I found at least for introductory students being very consistent helps with the learning. Um, and I'm interested in the question of whether those different syntaxes impact learning, they're more or less learnable and maybe whether they lead to different conceptions of data. So um, we know that human language shapes the way we think. So Lara Boroditsky has this great TED talk about this idea of how human language shapes our thinking. And I think uh, why should programming languages be any different? Uh, I recently published a paper uh, in the American Statistician, which is called Key Attributes of a Modern Statistical Computing Tool, and it's based off of my dissertation research. Um, in this paper, I'm outlining a set of attributes that I think are necessary for a modern statistical computing tool, something that people who are developing tools should be looking toward. And this work was inspired by the work of John Tukey in the 1960s and 1970s and of Rolf Bieler in the 1990s. And both Tukey and Bieler were thinking about how our statistical interfaces could make us more productive and also could better support students. So um, this paper is, is much more general than the talk that I'm giving today. But when I started thinking about the idea of speaking R, I realized that many of the attributes have a connection to speaking code. So uh, one attribute that I outline is the importance of accessibility. And that means that if you're gonna have a statistical computing tool, it needs to be accessible to a wide audience. It needs to be free or at least very cheap you need to be able to install it on many different operating systems, and it needs to work for a lot of different people. Um, it needs to have easy entry. So if someone is just getting started, there needs to be a low threshold so that they can get into uh, the language uh, more easily. And I'll show you how speaking relates to that. Um, probably the most related to speaking code is the idea of inherent documentation. So this is, if you have a tool, it should show you or tell you what it's going to do. So if you have a graphical user interface, the buttons should be icons that make it visually clear what they're going to do. Maybe there'll be animations as some process is taking place. And for a textual programming language, that probably means that the programming language is as similar to human language as you can get. Um, and then the last attribute that I think is related is the flexibility to build extensions. So um, I've been talking a lot about uh, teaching and learning R already, and maybe I'm losing some of you because you're not that interested in teaching and learning. But I think what makes R uh, very powerful and um, ha has helped R develop over time is this flexibility to build extensions. So it's possible to extend the language, to make your own packages, to put them on CRAN and give them to other people. Um, and I think that if you're someone who is trying to extend the language in one way or another, uh, it's important to think about uh, these attributes as you're developing your tools. Um, I also think, you know, if even if you're an expert, speaking your code out loud could help you work more efficiently. Uh, we're all in this situation where we're doing a lot of remote work and maybe we're going to have to debug or pair program over Zoom or Skype. Um, and having speakable code is going to make it um, easier for you to do those things. And then finally, if you make code that's speakable, that might make it so that more people would use your packages. 
All right, so I outlined uh, some of these attributes really quickly, but then I wanna dig deeper into a few of them. So I talked about accessibility in terms of price and operating systems, but uh, a really important piece is the accessibility for all kinds of people. So I think that the idea of universal design is really relevant here. So universal design means you're gonna design something so that lots of people can use it um, regardless of many things. Um, and it needs to be designed to meet the needs of all the people who might want to use that product. So if we're gonna design a programming language, it needs to be usable by a lot of people. And so, uh, I think about disabilities um, as a particular concern for universal design. Uh, and you know, some people can't see, some people can't type. Uh, if, you, if you can't type, either because you were born with some type of disability or you developed one later in life, um, a lot of the programmers here uh, that I have on my slide developed repetitive stress injuries in their wrists and then could no longer use their hands to enter code on the computer. So if you're someone who can't type, there's two strategies. One is you speak to the computer. So you use your voice as the interface and you have some type of uh, like speech recognition um, tool running that can translate what you're saying into code on the page. I'd really recommend Emily Shea's talk, Perl Out Loud, to hear how she codes in Perl. It's very interesting. Um, and another uh, strategy would be to speak to another person. So Ian Gilman has a post about um, apprentices uh, and he has taken the approach of not speaking to the computer, but hiring an apprentice who can act as his hands. Um, and the relationship between him and his apprentices is really interesting because it's not just them uh, translating exactly what he says onto the page. Um, they begin to help him with debugging tasks. And he's found that the programmers who do this, they level up their programming skills, maybe just uh, because they've been able to observe a master programmer um, in all the minutia of his work for such a long time. So speaking code or having speakable code is going to help people who can't type. Um, there's also people who can't see. So if you are blind or uh, vision impaired, then you probably use a screen reader, which is going to read out code uh, into your ear. And again, if you uh, are listening to code, you probably want code that sounds uh, readable to your ear. Um, there's lots of programmers who have learned to program in languages that maybe are not as human language like, uh, but it's probably easier to do that if you have some human language attributes. So I'm most familiar with people, blind folks who program in R and in particular, Jonathan Godfrey is the person that you want to be looking up. Um, he's spoken at Use R several times and um, he has a website where he talks about like many different types of statistical software and reviews uh, how accessible they are for blind users. Um, basically he's saying like R is the best, but it could be better. And then maybe SAS is catching up. Um, and when I say R uh, is the best, um, R, the language, is pretty accessible. R Studio, the IDE, used to not be accessible. And recently, they've added some screen reader capabilities. I've played with them a little myself. I'm not a screen reader expert, but it seems like there's still some work to be done. But the language itself is pretty accessible. Um, just one more note on disabilities. Um, I'm not gonna talk much about deaf people. Uh, I don't know much about how uh, they program or learn to read or write and how that's different. Um, but I think that there are, there's certainly connections to be made there. Uh, so we've talked about people who can't see, people who can't type. Um, there's another aspect of accessibility, which I think um, maybe is a little more invisible, which is the idea that English is the language of computing. So maybe we agree that we should have code that is speakable, that sounds like human language, and that's going to make it easier for a lot of people to use it. But what we're saying is English is easy for people. So if you look at the top 10 programming languages from the TOB index, uh, you know, C, Java, Python, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, JavaScript, R made the list um, move up a little bit recently. Uh, and all of those languages are based on English. There are some programming languages that are based on other human languages, but most of the time it's English. So we have to keep that in our mind when we're thinking about um, making languages, programming languages clearer, that we're uh, having this sort of implicit assumption that people speak English. 
And I think there's probably intersectionality as well. So if you're blind and your first language is in English, it's probably gonna be doubly hard to learn how to program. So that's about accessibility and the way that speaking code could help with accessibility. Um, I think speaking code also helps with ease of entry. So Felina Hermans has a great keynote from uh, RStudioConf in 2019. It was technically called Explicit Direct Instruction in Programming Education, but she subtitled it How to Teach Programming and Other Things. Um, and I had a lot of takeaways from her talk. So she said, you know, minimal guidance does not work. You can't just say, ah, oh, here's a book on programming, learn. You need to teach people how to program. Um, and there's research about how people learn, not as much in computer science, although the CS ed uh, literature is growing every day, um, but there's lots of research about how people learn to read and write. Um, and there has been debate in terms of how to teach people to read. Uh, so like this phonetics versus whole language debate. Um, and they did, studies about it and they figured out that phonetics works better. So uh, teaching people to sound out words um, is a good way to teach them to read. So students start by reading out loud and then the silent reading sort of like reading inside your head that comes later on. So she says we don't have this kind of debate in computer science education, maybe we should. I think also we don't have enough research in computer science education. And actually Felina has done a study, which I have linked here, the effect of reading code aloud on comprehension. Um, and she showed that uh, reading code out loud does seem to help people who are learning. So uh, this, uh, Keynote really um, underscored my practice, which I already had of, of reading code out loud, but it, it just sort of confirmed that this is probably something that's really valuable for learners. Um, in the summer of 2019, I also had the opportunity to get Carpentries certified. So the Carpentries is a global nonprofit. Uh, they teach people to become instructors, and then the instructors go on to teach other people how to program, mostly in Python and R, but there's also Git and Unix and all kinds of um, useful computing skills. And they do this two-day uh, instructor training, which is based on um, evidence of how people teach and learn the best. And so I have a few takeaways that I got from that training. Uh, teach the most useful thing first, which I think uh, we see in data science education. Mina Tatinkia Rundell has the data science in a box, and her version of that is start with cake, like start with the good stuff. Um, you want to reduce the cognitive load. And uh, I think that that relates to what Felina was saying in her keynote about how it's important to get uh, people to be able to sort of sound out code because then they're not starting from scratch. Every time they look at something, it's lower cognitive load. And then the last two bullets here, I think really relate to speaking code. So one is don't touch the learner's keyboard and the other is verbalize what you are doing. So if you're using a graphical user interface, you need to verbalize what you're doing. You say every movement that you're making with your mouse. So I'm going to the file menu, I'm selecting uh, save as, then I'm clicking on this, right? You have to verbalize every step. And if you're writing a textual program, then you need to read out loud the code as you're writing it. So uh, again, I had already been doing this to an extent, but the Carpentries really underscore that that's a super important thing to verbalize what you're doing. And then they say, don't touch the learner's keyboard. So this means if you have a student who's struggling and you go over to them and you look over their shoulder, don't take the keyboard away from them and do it for them. You need to help them figure it out. So you know, put your cursor at the end of the line um, and then write a parenthesis, uh, you know, type this. Um, and so that really requires a lot of verbalization. Um, there's another aspect uh, to this like ease of entry, um, a strategy for teaching programming. Uh, this video is from teaching kids, but I think it applies at all levels, is this idea of pair programming. So in pair programming, one person drives, they have their hands on the keyboard, and the other person navigates. So they help guide um, and strategize and debug. So uh, this really reminds me of Ian Gilman's Wrists and Apprentices piece, where he's saying that he had someone who had their hands on the keyboard for him. Um, and this is shown, it doesn't just work when someone is a master and someone is a, an apprentice, it also works works with peers, uh, that they can work together in this way. Um, and again, they're going to need to be verbalizing the code out loud in order to do that. 
So uh, verbalizing code maybe helps with, uh, with ease of entry. And then, of course, the biggest piece here is the idea of inherent documentation. So code that tells you what it's going to do. And in R, some function pronunciations are really clear. Mean, summary, help, paste. Of course, we're assuming that you know English, but those are English words, and so they're pretty easy to pronounce. But uh, there are many functions that try to save characters, and those can become less easy to pronounce. So for example, the str function, uh, I've heard that the canonical pronunciation is actually stir, and it's short for structure. Uh, so stir penguins uh, rather than str penguins. Um, and uh, another classic one is runif. Um, if you know English and you're reading that function name for the first time, it looks like run if. So run if for, nope, that's not what it does. It's not a control statement. It is runif, uh, random numbers from the uniform distribution. So maybe rand unif would have been better. That would have been more characters to type out, so maybe a little less efficient there, but more efficient in terms of the cognitive load of that function. So I think um, the function names uh, are, are one aspect of it, but there's a lot more to reading code out loud. Um, and I thought maybe other languages have this figured out. So there's a great thread on the software engineering stack exchange, which is called standards for reading code out loud. And I'd really recommend you go look at it. So, um, you know, someone asks, are there standards for reading code out loud? And then there's a bunch of great debate. So, um, uh, one thing that I got from it is that there are different levels of reading code out loud. So one poster says, if you say hash bang bin bash or shebang bash, just about everyone will know what code that corresponds to. But if they don't, then you'll step it down a notch. At the top of the file, pound sign, exclamation mark, slash, bin, slash, bash, new line. If they still don't get it, you step it down yet again. See that keyboard in front of you? See the three key? That mark at the top of when you press shift is a pound sign, that. Um, so I think that uh, there's not just one way to read code. There's sort of different uh, levels depending on your audience. Um, if you're working with someone who really knows the language, maybe you can shorthand it a little bit. Um, and other posters uh, say things like, I agree, I almost never read the code word for word. I just explain what it's doing. I would never try to type it with my tongue. And I actually disagree with this poster. I think that sometimes, especially if you are talking to someone who does not know the language, you do have to more or less type it with your tongue. You have to uh, read out um, the characters. So in R, uh, we have more than just function names. We also have symbols. Uh, one category of symbols are assignment operators. So we have the sort of less than and dash assignment operator. Um, I've heard that pronounced as gets. A gets for or A is for. I've also heard set A to for. And that last one is not my preferred pronunciation uh, because it doesn't follow the left to right reading convention of English. Uh, with A gets for, you're sort of reading each of those um, elements on the line left to right. But set A to for is more like telling someone what the code is doing. It's less like verbalizing the code out loud. Um, Apparently, I don't have my uh, equal sign on this slide. I don't know what happened. Uh, the, the other column is supposed to have the equals assignment operator, uh, which I have heard verbalized as A equal for, A is for, or A gets for. I haven't heard as many people verbalizing the equal sign as set A to for. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, and then we have more assignment operators. So there's uh, the right assignment operator, like the dash and the greater than sign. Um, and I use that very infrequently, but you know, we were talking about these different syntaxes which have their own conventions. Maybe that right assignment operator actually makes more sense in the tidyverse syntax. So, um, you know, sort of into or gives uh, and then the name of the variable at the end of um, your pipeline. Um, so uh, going back to Felina's research, when she was looking at people who were verbalizing code out loud, uh, the assignment operator, that's one of the things that people were the most likely to vocalize. Uh, but uh, as we can see in R, they might not be totally consistent about it. 
And the sad thing is that I'm not gonna tell you the answer. That's not what this talk is about. And you probably know there's lots of words in English that have many pronunciations. I just thought of a couple technical ones. I say LaTeX and GIF, but other people say LaTeX or LaTeX and GIF. Um, and you know, if you look at the definition for GIF on uh, Merriam Webster, it actually has both pronunciations as accepted. So the most important thing is consistency. It doesn't really matter which one you pick, but you should be very consistent about it. Um, and this reminded me of Roger Peng's 2018 use R keynote, where he says uh, about R, it's a language for data analysis. And if you think that the language is a little incoherent, a little confusing, a bit of a maze, well, then all I have to say is, Welcome to data analysis. So uh, it just continues as you start unfolding. So there's a, a blog post on ASCII pronunciation rules for programmers. Um, it got referenced on that uh, Stack Exchange thread. Um, and it has ways to pronounce ASCII characters. Um, so quotation mark, that's pretty standard. Dollar sign. There's not many other ways to pronounce that ASCII character, uh, but some ASCII characters have additional meaning in R. So this is again, there's like the levels of reading code, uh, the exclamation mark. Uh, if I was going to pronounce that ASCII character, that's probably the only way that I would say it. But in R, the exclamation mark means not. And so sometimes I might say not as in not equal uh, and expect someone to be able to know that they need to make that exclamation mark. The pound sign, the number sign, you could call that a comment in R. Uh, the tilde or twiddle um, is by in the uh, formula syntax. Um, and the bar or vertical bar, or uh, myself and my students prefer V bar because it's uh, shorter to say, that means or in R. So uh, ASCII characters can be verbalized other than just as their character, they can have semantic meaning inside the language. Um, and I think one place where this is really apparent in R are the use of parentheses. So you could say head, open paren, penguins, close paren, or head, left paren, penguins, right paren. But because R is a functional language, we often think of uh, the function notation f of x. So you could say head of penguins. And I think that that actually has some good English language meaning when you verbalize that out loud. So some functions that work really well that way um, are like LM of bill length MM by flipper length MM data equal penguins or plot of flipper length MM by bill length MM data equal penguins. You could also bring your dollar signs in here if you wanted to. So uh, LM of or plot of those, those make sense when I'm using this sort of function uh, way of pronouncing the parentheses but it gets less effective as your code gets more verbose. So if I'm gonna say summary of LM of bill length MM, that's already getting kind of hard to unpack. And even if I use this sort of two line approach, M1 gets LM of all that stuff and then summary of M1, um, it's almost like a pronoun in human language. You have to think uh, what M1 refers to and you're almost doing that nesting yourself. Um, of course, the nested way of uh, writing the code is more efficient. Luke Tierney was talking about that in his keynote yesterday, but I don't think it's quite as readable. So, of course, we have the McGritter pipe, uh, the percent greater than percent, uh, which you could pronounce as pipe, or I think the canonical pronunciation is then, so penguins, then head. Uh, that loses the of that maybe is useful about the parentheses, um, but power of the pipe comes from longer pipelines. So this is a pretty um, common example that uh, Hadley Wickham gives. I found this in a talk that he gave at Reed College in 2016, but I've seen him talk about it in many venues, uh, where he's giving the example of little bunny foo-foo. And so you could either do it as a series of nested functions, which is very hard for the human brain to parse. And I think if you were reading it out loud, maybe especially so, or you could use the pipe. And then you can say foo foo, then hop through forest, then scoop up field mouse, then bop on head. And that is gonna allow you to think more linearly, more uh, left to right as if you were reading in English. 
So maybe this is less efficient in compute time, but it's more efficient in terms of your human brain um, and your level of cognitive load. Uh, it's reducing that. And just another comment about language. Um, the Magritter pipe on the hex sticker says, ceci ne pas un peep. Um, this is not a pipe. And that's a reference um, to Rene Magritte's The Treachery of Images, uh, where he is saying like the image of the pipe is not a pipe. Uh, that was the original piece of art. Um, and that V bar that we've talked about before um, is often called the pipe in programming, like in Unix, that the V bar would be the pipe, but we're using the V bar symbol to mean or in R. So, you know, species is at a Lee or bill length is greater than 50, something like that. Um, so again, there's, there's sort of translation issues when you're moving from one language to another, uh, and maybe the, the pronunciation of the pipe is, is a challenge. So I'd like to think a little bit more about what makes learning a language particularly hard. So we can think about things from human spoken languages and what makes them hard, and we can think about how that relates to speaking R. So there are words um, that are known as homonyms or homophones or homographs. So homophones are words that are pronounced the same, but spelled differently and have different meanings. So pair and pair, weak and weak, meet and meet, see and see. When I'm saying them verbally out loud, you can't tell which one I'm saying. Uh, there's also homographs, which are spelled the same, but have different pronunciation and different meanings. So, uh, bass drum versus go fishing and catch a bass, eat at the buffet versus get buffeted about, and a tear ran down my face because I got a tear in my dress. Um, and those are things that maybe are gonna make it harder for you to parse a sentence in English. Felina talked about this in her R Studio keynote as well, um, but are then gonna make it harder for you to use the language because um, they, they have these sort of double meanings. So um, in R, uh, in terms of homophones, uh, things that are spelled differently and have different meanings, um, I have a habit when I'm verbalizing code of saying then when I mean the pipe, but I also use it to mean line break. So I'll be dictating code to a student and I'll say, ah, then we're going to whatever. And that means like start a new line so we can do something else. So those are both getting pronounced the same by me verbally, but they're spelled very differently um, and they have different meanings. And then the uh, homographs are the things that are spelled the same but have different meanings. So an example would be the V bar again, it's usually or, but in the formula syntax, it's taking on another meaning. So if I'm doing uh, in GG formula, a GF point of a couple variables, uh, given sex, that's gonna give me a faceted graph by uh, the sex of the, the penguins. So um, that is something that could make it challenging to learn R. Um, I also think that periods are homonyms, um, which are things that are uh, spelled the same and pronounced the same, but have different meanings. So uh, we could have periods that indicate a method like plot.dendrogram, plot.factor, plot.lm. I think as and data are both um, uh, examples of this. And then sometimes functions just have periods of them as delimiters, read.csv, contrib.url. Uh, but that period usually gets pronounced as dot. Another thing that can make um, learning a human language difficult are silent characters. So we have silent letters in English, debt, hustle, night. You're not hearing all of the letters there. Um, and in R, there are also characters that we don't pronounce very frequently. So I think I've read you this code before, LM of fill length MM by flipper length MM, data equal penguins. Um, and at that level of verbalizing the code, um, I'm not saying the closing paren. I'm saying the first one, the open paren as of, but I'm not closing it off. I'm kind of just assuming that you know that when I stop speaking, it's gonna close it off, almost like a, a period in, um, in English commas, much like uh, in English where a comma just means like kind of make a pause when you're speaking. I don't, uh, sometimes I don't verbalize commas. Spaces really don't get verbalized. Um, and then line breaks um, usually don't get verbalized. 
And Felina found the same stuff in uh, her study um, about reading code aloud, the indent space indentation spaces um, and like white space that was the least verbalized of the code. Um, so if I'm teaching uh, and it is people who are really new to the language or uh, people who are visually impaired, um, it, it's really important to vocalize every single character that I see on the screen. LM open paren bill underscore length underscore mm by flipper underscore length underscore mm comma data equal penguins close paren. Again, there's, there's different levels of, of vocalization. I think we also tend not to pronounce square brackets. So letters four, um, I, I might make some kind of like shape in the air with my hands, but I wouldn't usually verbalize it. Um, and then periods and underscores. So I was not saying the underscores in that LM call, uh, but I've heard both read.csv and read underscore CSV just pronounced as read CSV. And so that could lead to a lot of confusion. Um, we do have style guides that help us with making decisions about our written code. So like the tidyverse style guide, um, when I went to look uh, at the style guide for this talk, I saw a note that said that um, the tidyverse style guide was de derived from the Google style guide, but now Google's style guide is derived from the tidyverse style guide. So I think that's the main one. There may be competing style guides out there, but um, I think tidyverse style guide is, is pretty much it. Um, and it suggests that we should be using snake case, so with underscores um, as delimiters, rather than camel case with uppercase letters. So if, if that's best practice for writing written code, we need a way to pronounce that underscore. Um, and one of the reasons why I don't say it very frequently is because it's so many syllables. So penguins, dollar sign, bill, underscore length, underscore mm, that's really long. I wish that we had something really short. So if you've got that, you should let me know. Um, I thought about the comedian Victor Borga, who has a bit about phonetic punctuation. Um, he's saying that it would be easier uh, to understand people when they were speaking English if they said the periods and commas and question marks out loud. And then he's got sort of hilarious vocalizations of those um, pieces of uh, punctuation. Um, I don't think that we should really go in that direction, um, but I think that it is something to think about. Um, if you have something that needs to be verbalized with a ton of syllables, that's almost like, you know, trying to save characters uh, with typed language. So str versus structure, uh, we, we went with the shorter function name um, for efficiency. Maybe we should be making those same kinds of choices um, when, we're, when we're thinking about uh, verbalizing code. Um, so uh, we have things that are maybe easier to say out loud and things that are harder to say out loud. And I think that that means that one of the ways that we can judge a programming language or a syntax or a domain specific language is by how easy it is to speak or verbalize that code. So I'm really interested in syntax, like I've said before, um, and there's some research in this area. So um, Andrea Stefik and Susanna Siebert have this uh, paper, An Empirical Investigation into Programming Language Syntax. And in this study, they had a bunch of novices look at code um, and, uh, and, and then try to produce it, I believe. Um, and they were comparing accuracy rates between a number of different languages. And what they found, um, Oh, I should tell you, uh, they, they had uh, C style languages like Perl and Java, and then they had non C style languages uh, like Python and Ruby. And they were also testing their own new language called Quorum, um, which is a programming language that's completely evidence based uh, that Stefik has been working on for a long time. And it's been designed to be usable by blind people. That's kind of one of the first principles of the language. So they're comparing these C style languages, the non C style, and then as um, a sort of placebo, they created this uh, sort of placeholder language called Randomo. And Randomo, they just took keywords, random keywords from the ASCII table and made a programming language out of that. So I've shown a few examples of the code here. There's, there's more examples in the paper, but it was hard to see on the slide. So I'm showing Quorum, which is the new programming language versus Perl, Randomo, and Python. Um, and they found that the languages using the sort of C style syntax were no better than Randomo in terms of um, accuracy rates. But the, the other languages, uh, Quorum, 
Python and Ruby um, were better in terms of accuracy rates. So that seems like, you know, there's something about syntax. And my hypothesis is that that something has to do with how readable it is, how, how similar to human language. I don't really want to get into the language wars here. Um, I think if you are trying to do data science and it's working well in Python, you should keep using Python. Um, if you're trying to learn data science, I would probably make the case that you should uh, pick R over Python. And one of the reasons is because of the speakability of Python code specifically for data science. So this is an exercise from data eight and data eight, I think is the largest data science course ever. Um, thousands of students take it um, in person at UC Berkeley, I think every semester, thousands more have taken it on edX. Um, and this is the first exercise from data eight. So there's like a little bit of lead up first, but this is really where they start seeing Python code. This is the first code they are exposed to. Um, and I'm not going to read it out loud to you. Um, it takes a long time to read through. And I think that's a really valuable thing to do when you're teaching, uh, but maybe not uh, as valuable in this setting right now. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to this line that is highlighted where um, we've got uh, this uh, code at the end of the line, which I had been misreading for months. I thought it was np.arrange and I was like, I don't know what these, um, these arguments mean. And I realized as I was preparing for this talk and um, uh, I looked up that function that it's actually np.a range. It makes a range presumably from one to 44 by one, although they haven't put the names of the arguments there. So I think that this is very opaque to someone who is not familiar with programming. It doesn't look much like human language at all. And it kind of has that aspect of nesting um, like we would see in, in R without pipes. So I actually ported that same exercise to tidyverse R using the tidy text package. And I think that this code is much more readable. Again, I'm not gonna read it all out loud to you, um, but I think that this is something which reads much more left to right. It has the you know, sort of tidyverse verbs, which are, um, I think, easier to understand in terms of human language and English. Um, and I think that this would be something that would be much more accessible to an introductory student. My other complaint about data eight is I don't think that this should be the first thing that you see when you uh, start data science ever. This would never be how I would begin um, in a data science course in R. I uh, usually start with you know, some data that's already wrangled and then we just make some pretty plots. Uh, we don't start with filter and group by and summarize and mutate, uh, that comes later. Um, so you know, starting with good stuff, uh, letting them eat cake first. Uh, I don't think that text analysis is, is really the cake, but that's me. Um, and so we can sort of bring that idea back to R. So if I've made this case that maybe Python is less readable uh, or speakable than R, we also have these syntaxes in R. And are some of them more speakable than others? Um, I think with all of them, we're trying to build up a vocabulary for people. Uh, the mosaic package philosophy is less volume, more creativity. And I think that's what we want across the board. Um, and again, I'm not really gonna tell you which one you should use. I think that the important thing is consistency. Uh, and so staying within one of those columns is more important than which column you really pick. But I think that if you look at the same task uh, done multiple ways, there's different readability of the different syntaxes. So if we're thinking about summary statistics, and here I'm doing a grouped mean. So I'm taking the mean of body mass in grams of these penguins and I'm breaking it down by species. Um, and this is maybe uh, sounds like a little bit complicated as in terms of a task for introductory students, but the gaze guidelines, uh, which guide uh, pre-K 12 and college education and statistics say that it's really important that students get experience with multivariable thinking. So two or more variables. Um, I think you can see that in formula syntax, uh, maybe it's a little bit easier to read mean of body mass G by species data equal penguins. Um, and I can be pretty consistent with that syntax uh, in formula. Um, I think that the tidy or syntax is also very readable. Penguins, then group by species, then summarize mean of body mass G. 
But I think that the base solution is much less readable. Mean of penguins dollar sign body mass G square bracket penguins dollar sign species equal equal Adelie square bracket close uh, paren close. And then I need to repeat that again for chinstrap and gen two penguins. Um, this is the kind of code that I have on my cheat sheet. I've switched it to the penguins for this presentation. Um, but one of the comments that I get about the cheat sheet is, well, you should really be using an apply solution. Um, so I've got the T apply solution there as well. T apply of penguins dollar sign body mass G comma penguins dollar sign species comma mean. And I think that that has very little meaning if you're thinking about reading it out loud. Um, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't sound like anything in English to me. Uh, that isn't the way that I would teach uh, novices because I don't have a great mental model to give them for that. And it's always pretty challenging for me to come up with the apply solutions, even though I've been programming in R for more than a decade. Um, you can see the same kinds of things with scatter plots. I think plot of that makes uh, more sense. Um, so base is looking a little better here, but uh, we've got the lattice graphics that use formula syntax like XY plot. And then there's the GG formula package, which gives us GG plot graphics, but in formula syntax. So like GF point. Um, and I think that those you can also say, you know, XY plot of GF point of. Uh, the Tigers solution is starting to be a little bit less compelling because we've got this plus, which maybe has different meanings. Um, and then I think if we get to uh, doing sets of scatter plots, it's even more obvious that some of these are easier to read than others. So formula, of course, we've got that V bar that I've talked about, which has different meaning in formula um, than in the rest of R. Uh, tidyverse, you just add another line. Maybe that's pretty understandable. But the, the base solution is extremely repetitive. And we know in programming, if we're repeating ourselves a lot, that probably means there's some more efficient way to do what we're doing. And if you're speaking code aloud, uh, it gets really tedious to repeat yourself that much. Um, so my guess is that there's an apply solution here. Um, I've futzed around with it for a little bit and I wasn't able to figure it out. Um, so, so you just see the sort of three plots there with the par uh, MF row uh, syntax uh, to stick them together. So maybe there's like a difference in readability between these three R syntaxes. Um, but it is one of them really easier for people to learn than another. Uh, and so this is a study that um, Andrea Stefik, who I've mentioned before with the Randomo work um, and several of his graduate students and myself collaborated on. Um, and it compared the three R syntaxes. So the base R syntax, the formula syntax, and the tidyverse syntax. And you can see there's like a sample of um, the tilde form, I think is what they're calling it here, um, a sample of code, and then another data set. And then it says, you know, sort of apply what you need. Um, and then there's an example of the kind of errors that participants uh, came up with. So, um, I don't know if I should say we or they, but uh, the paper didn't find a difference uh, between any of these three syntaxes in terms of completion time or number of errors. Uh, but when I look at these results, what I see is a lot of misunderstanding about variables and data frames. So the first error, they have the variable name correctly, but they don't understand that they need to get the name of the data set. And actually, in my own experience teaching R, it's usually the other way around. They understand the data set, but not the variable name. Um, but I think that that was the thing that was primarily going wrong. Um, and I would have loved to see a comparison like with Randomo to see if any, anything was better than that. I think that part of the conclusion is just that R is pretty readable. Um, and then another piece of this is there was no teaching. So they just said, here's what the syntax looks like. Now try and match it. So it was more of like a symbol matching activity rather than um, really producing some new code. So as another little bit of an experiment, um, this past semester, I had the opportunity to teach two R labs at the University of St. Thomas for the first time. So like I said, I've been teaching R for almost 10 years. I've taught a lot of introductory statistics classes. I teach you know, advanced R programming, um, I teach regression classes, but with this work, I'm mostly thinking about the introductory statistics courses or introductory data science. And I've taught those courses staying all in base R, all in formula and all in tidyverse. Um, 
But other than saying like, well, I'm pretty sure that base R is not the way to go. I didn't really have a conclusion as to which was better, formula or tidyverse. And there's a lot of discussion in the statistics education community about which one should be used. So in spring 2020, I decided I have two labs. I'm gonna teach one in formula syntax and one in tidyverse syntax. And um, I had this sort of unique opportunity because at St. Thomas, the lab assignments are standardized across all the labs uh, and all the softwares. So there's labs in Jump and SPSS and Minitab and Excel and R. And the, uh, the lab questions are platform agnostic. So I think usually when I'm writing questions, I'm implicitly thinking about what's gonna be easy to answer in R or what's gonna be easy to answer in this particular syntax. So I'm colored by uh, that language. Um, but these labs did not have that type of influence. Um, so I created pre-labs to teach the concepts for each of these 11 labs in Formula and Tidyverse that are on my GitHub if you wanna go look at them. And because we switched to online teaching mid-semester, uh, videos of me teaching the first or the last few labs are available on my YouTube channel. So there's Formula videos and Tidyverse videos. Um, and there's more work that would need to be done in order to actually analyze them. But I just wanted to show you, um, for example, uh, one of the tasks was to do a confidence interval using the bootstrap. Um, and I think actually there's lots of strengths of both the tidyverse and the formula syntax here, especially in terms of readability. So with the tidyverse, I'm using the infer package and I'm doing penguins, then I'm gonna specify a response, then I'm gonna generate reps equal a thousand, type equal bootstrap, then I'm gonna calculate a stat, which is mean. Um, so that I think is breaking down the, the pieces of inference really nicely. You specify, you generate, you calculate. Um, and that's one of the real powers of the infer package is that it's standardized that across um, a lot of inferential tasks. The formula syntax is also uh, pretty good. Um, we've got this do operator, which is different than dplyr do. It comes from the mosaic package. It'll do something a thousand times, for example, kind of overloading the asterisk here, but it's gonna um, take the mean of that variable and it's gonna use the data equal, the resampled version of penguins. So again, I think that this is, this is pretty readable. Um, uh, but I picked this lab in particular because I think that uh, both syntaxes felt pretty much equally strong here. Um, and that wasn't the case across all of the labs. So with the formula syntax, things that were easy uh, was like introducing the idea of modeling. Uh, they've already seen the formula syntax in tally and mean and GF point. So then the way that you specify models just feels completely consistent. And it's pretty easy to do inference when you want to use a distributional approximation using prop.test and t.test. Um, dealing with NA values was harder. Um, I had some trouble when we needed to move off RStudio Cloud and I felt inconsistent when I was doing data wrangling. So the formula syntax doesn't have a, sort of a formula way of doing data wrangling. So I used the filter command um, and just did it as a one-liner to do a little bit of data wrangling so that I didn't have to introduce the pipe. Um, the tidyverse uh, had great connections to inference from the infer package. Uh, it was a little bit easier when we had to move off our studio cloud. Um, that process was easier for the tidyverse lab. Um, but there were hard things like trying to explain the difference between the pipe and the plus. Um, there was inconsistency when we got to modeling. So even though I wanted to not show them the tilde at all, I couldn't figure out another way to do a linear model or an ANOVA without doing that. Um, and then inference using distributional approximations was tough. Uh, there's, there's not parallels that use the tidy syntax to things like prop test or t test. Um, but both, uh, both labs, um, our markdown went pretty well. And doing this debugging with the hands off the keyboard, that worked well. You know, I had been doing verbalization and not touching learners' keyboards when we were in person. And so when we had to move online for the pandemic, um, it, it was pretty smooth to do that kind of debugging from afar. Um, the things that were hard uh, were the things that are always hard, like moving files around and understanding file paths. Um, at, but I think the number one most difficult thing, which again relates to the study that Stefik um, et al. have done, is variables. Students would really struggle to understand that species was the variable and not the levels of the variable. Um, 
so they would be putting things like chin strap directly into their code, thinking that that was the variable. Um, so I've got some thinking to do about that uh, in terms of maybe we should be considering more dummy variables. Maybe those are more intuitive to students, or maybe there's some conception of data that's, that's not happening in people's heads. Um, so uh, I have a few um, ideas of what we could do to make it easier to verbalize code um, and to be more consistent with that. And one piece would be to add a pronunciation guide. So there's the um, International Phonetic Alphabet, which has a way to um, sort of mark down with symbols how to pronounce something. And so when I showed you that Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary entry of GIF, um, it had some uh, some ways to um, pronounce uh, the, uh, the word um, with different pronunciations. Um, and, and people like Yiwei Jia have put pronunciation guides for their packages uh, onto their GitHub pages. So I think that that would be a great, uh, a great step and I would encourage you to do that. So um, Back to my big ideas, right? So I've been reading you this line of code over and over again, and hopefully you believe me that code is language and that our code in particular is language. Um, I'm not gonna tell you if you should use Python or R or if you should use base or formula or tidyverse, but I am gonna say consistency is key. You should use just one syntax and you should try to be consistent with the way you pronounce symbols. Um, and then if you're developing new packages or new uh, DSLs or new language elements, you should try to make sure that your code is speakable. Um, of course, uh, when we're thinking about uh, verbalizing code, there's these different levels of verbalization um, from the more abstract to the more specific. Um, and it seems like words are easy. Uh, again, thinking about English language speakers, uh, but you know, function names, those are a little bit easier than thinking about how to pronounce symbols. Um, and I would love us to get some type of style guide for how uh, you could speak those out. Again, not gonna tell you how to do it, but maybe we could have a few different pronunciations that are accepted. So I'd just like to thank uh, Stefik and his graduate students for um, their great work and work with me. Um, I have some friends who watched me do a version of this talk, uh, like Sean, Julia, Ian, Jesse, and Kara. I really appreciate you all for doing that. Um, I'm super grateful to the Use Our Organizing Committee uh, for asking me to speak here um, and for everyone out there in the audience for watching. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Milia. It was a truly thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, uh, there are several questions uh, that uh, people are asking and curious to get the answers. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, it says, um, do you have any recommendations for further reading about what it's like for a non-English speaker to learn to program in English-based languages? I've often wondered about this. Um, I, I don't have any great resources. Um, I, you know, when I was looking at programming languages, it seems like um, the, the languages that are, that are not in English, like there are very few languages that are um, in a different human language. Um, there are languages where you can kind of like, I think there's a version of JavaScript where you can write it in many different languages and then it gets kind of converted to English. Uh, but I don't specifically know about um, that sort of added cognitive load. I just kind of assume that it's there because, um, you know, many things are harder for English language speakers. I just saw Felina was tweeting some research today about, um, I think it was um, learning psychology uh, for Dutch students, learning it in Dutch versus in English, and um, the students who learned it in their native language did better than the students who uh, learned it in English. Um, and so I, I would sort of assume that that same kind of thing is happening with um, programming. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just ask, uh, your presentation will be on your website, the link for your slides, so people will be able to get links to some of the references you put in, in them. Yep, um, yeah. should be up on my website now. I think I tweeted the link and it's amelia.mn slash speaking R uh, and capital S and capital R. Brilliant. Okay, um, there are some other questions. So. Um, Another one would be, do you think the pairing idea with one student speaking and one typing would work with students working together remotely via Zoom or other texts? 
I think that it does work. So um, for the labs that I was teaching in the spring, uh, students are allowed to work together as long as they each submit their own lab assignment. Um, and you know, I know in particular, there were two women who always liked to work together and they would come to my Zoom office hours um, together. Uh, you know, I sort of used the waiting room function. I would let them both in and one of them would share her screen and she would say, here's what we're you know, thinking about. Um, and the other one would be chiming in, you know, and then this, this didn't work. So I think that they had been FaceTiming or something ahead of time and then they came into my Zoom meeting to ask questions. Um, I will say that I am really looking forward to uh, if and when our studio has the kind of like Google Docs collaborative editing, because I think if you're going to do that, like sharing the screen is one thing, but it would be easier if you could really see directly what the, the person who is driving sure. is doing. Sure. Uh, so it's uh, really down to technology we, we use uh, to try some of those uh, tips uh, that you have uh, put forward. Uh, so another question. Uh, is there a better way to tell someone to execute their code, oops, uh, execute their code in the console beside press enter? Sorry, the questions are flipping on my sure. screen. Um, so again, I think that this is one of those, like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. There's lots of ways that you can um, do all of your pedagogy, uh, but I've been pretty convinced of the stay out of the console approach and um, sort of start with our markdown. So for those labs, I always have an R markdown document. Um, for the first couple of labs, they're actually on our Studio Cloud ahead of time so that students just click on them and they open and they have blanks written in like, you know, there's some, you know, an empty code chunk and they write their code in there. And then I teach them about the play button or control enter um, to execute the code. Um, so, so that's the approach that I've taken. So I don't usually have people working in the console. I do think that there's this cognitive difference um, or like challenge of thinking about the R session that gets executed when you knit your R markdown document versus the one that is sort of as you're working interactively. Um, and again, I wish that I had better language or something about that because students usually find that pretty difficult. I know uh, you're focusing really on um, coding uh, in terms of using R, but what about um, statistical concepts uh, that uh, you need to you know, enable people to understand? Uh, so sometimes, for example, I tend to put uh, on the website chunks of code that they can just put on clipboard and paste so that they can really focus on um, what's going on and communicate the output that that particular code is going to tell. Uh, so how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I think um, it depends on the, the class that you're teaching. So for an introductory statistics class, like um, those labs that I was talking about, I tell students explicitly, like, we're learning to use R. You're going to be doing programming. Like, I really consider scripting programming. I know there's some debate about that. Um, so you're going to be programming, but mostly you're going to be learning how to um, use R to get the output and then interpret it. Um, and I've started saying this at the beginning of the semester. Um, so I tell the students like, oftentimes I get to the end of the semester and I get my evaluations back and students say, all I learned how to do was change variables in the code. Um, I couldn't write my own code from scratch. Um, and I think that that's like, that's not, that's not ideal. I would love you to feel more confident in your coding skills at the end of the semester. But honestly, if you really deeply understand how to change out variables in code and get it to run, that that is a success. Um, and like we wouldn't expect someone to be fluent in a human language after one semester. Um, and so like, again, I, I think I agree with you that if you're teaching a statistics class, the statistics concepts are the most important and the programming is kind of in service of that. Um, but wherever you can like get sort of symbiosis is, is really powerful. I really like the idea of pairing and I think it's something uh, I'm definitely gonna try, especially with the younger generation. So um, yeah, I'm gonna take that away as, as a good tip. Uh, okay, so I'll move uh, again on to some of the questions. Um, uh, it says here, uh, what challenges does teaching remotely as many of us are doing now and in the fall uh, introduce to the idea of speaking code? Um, I think that it's like as valuable as ever and, and maybe more valuable to be able to speak code out loud. Um, I, in the process of preparing for this talk, went back and found a video that I made a 
like seven plus years ago. Um, and it's a screen capture where you can just see my screen and then I'm speaking aloud. Um, and I think if, you know, if I wasn't speaking, there would be no like learning that could possibly come out of that video. Um, and so me reading the code out loud is, is vitally important. Um, and uh, again, like as I've gotten better at being explicit about what I'm verbalizing and maybe doing it at different levels throughout the semester, I think that that helps support students. Um, there's another aspect which is kind of meta. So like today we have uh, live captioning services that are happening uh, for folks who are deaf or hearing impaired. Mm -hmm. And um, with my YouTube videos, I have used the automatic captioning so that whatever I'm verbalizing is getting translated back into text. And then I'm going through the auto captions and trying to edit them to be correct. And it's a sort of debate of like, if I'm gonna, write CSV, do I write the letters CSV or do I write out the sort of phonetic, uh, you know, C-E-E, E-S-S-V-E-E? -E -E? Uh, like, is that valuable? And again, sure. I don't know as much about people who are deaf. Um, so the, the idea of like captioning, um, I don't know how that comes into this, uh, you know, speaking code, but I really think that um, it's, it's just as valuable, if not more valuable as we move to remote instruction. It's certainly, uh, it's important. Uh, and, you know, the more I've heard now from you, from your talk, uh, it does make me question some of the method methodologies I use in my, in my teaching. Uh, and um, what I really, really like, it's uh, almost like uh, our evolving uh, with Tidyverse. It was more intuitive and it was very hard for people to move from BASA. Like for me, it took a while to kind of move on to using Tidy tidyverse, uh, but I think this is also a way, the way language is going to progress and evolve. It just takes time. But I think for a new generation, they clearly, they're going to adopt those ideas, I, I hope much quicker than perhaps some of us who have been using R for a while and other programming languages. So um, again, another question. Um, what is your recommendation reading the syntax and how do you read out loud uh, when you are including documentation into your code. For example, using a function from a specific package, uh, data.table, uh, colon, colon, three brackets. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's like a great example. You like someone typed that code into the question box, then you had to verbalize it out loud to me. Um, and I think, you know, the way that you did it is, is great and, and would work. Um, again, I think like colon that that's like sort of more, um, it's, it's not like a lot of syllables, but it's like more uh, verbal space than you really want to give to it. Um, I, I, I do say colon colon when I'm talking about a function from a particular package. Uh, but again, I, I recommend you go watch the Victor Borga, the comedian, because he's got a way of pronouncing the, the colon, which is just like, <laughs> so you, you're like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe we ha we'll have some other ways of vocalizing some of those ASCII symbols at some point. Yeah, we need some phonetics for it, for them as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, can you give us some more examples of how we can, uh, sorry, how we, um, as instructors, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, okay, can you give some more examples of how we, as instructors, reduce the cognitive burden that new learners of R have? Yeah, so um, I think the idea of cognitive burden is super important. Um, and uh, again, like Felina has been so influential to my thinking. Um, and one of her points is that students should memorize code. Uh, some that feels kind of like old school to some of us. Um, and I know that I personally was saying, you know, I'm going to always give you the example code and you just change the, the you know, the variables. Um, but I've actually started giving students in certain classes, not in every class, um, quizzes where they have to write our code by hand and they, you know, they do flashcards and they memorize things. Um, and I think that um, it's like you always would teach a student the alphabet um, and, and to sound out sounds if they were reading. Um, and without having people like memorize things about programming, then you're kind of always in this state of really high cognitive load. And so you need the building blocks um, to be able to really build things together. And so I think, um, you know, getting students to, to memorize some code is part of it. Um, maybe also, you know, the starting with the good stuff. Um, and then 
I've really tried to abstract away all of the, you know, the installation. I think our Studio Cloud is really powerful because I can have um, all the packages already installed, the data already there, the, the file there, I just say, go log on. Um, and, and then we can talk about installation later, but they just jump right into like doing something that's maybe interesting, making some plots or something like that. So um, trying to save the, the cognitive space for actually useful concepts. So do you advocate uh, using snippets in, in our studio? Um, I have to say I'm not a snippet user, um, but I, I think that I would love to learn more about how they could be used. It's something that uh, I also kind of have on my list, things to learn to use perhaps more often to see would it help, uh, rather than kind of trying to dig through your codes all the time, trying to find out uh, what uh, can you use and uh, the rest. Um, I have also a question based on some of your tweets uh, that you've done in the past, uh, especially uh, recently since this COVID. Um, can we? Uh, can you just give us a tip on kind of teaching kids homeschooling? I know you told us that uh, you've been homeschooled as, as a kid and uh, doing recipes, cooking uh, half recipes. It's a really mm -hmm. good uh, good thing that I I have been adopted. Uh, I've adopted with my my kids so. Any, uh, sure. Anything else? Um, I can see in the chat that we're uh, that we're out of time. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I, I've had a really interesting educational path. I think that I didn't learn things the same way many people did. I was homeschooled as a child. I went to art school for a while. Um, I was an English major in college. So um, like, I think that there's there's value to the liberal arts is, is one thing that I'll say. Um, and, and I think that we wanna sort of like broaden um, data science by sort of bringing that all in. It's not really an answer to your question, but if we're trying to wrap up, maybe I'll just leave it there. Anyway, I will follow your tweets and okay. perhaps find something more. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I think we need to uh, wrap up uh, and I would really like to thank you for uh, your excellent talk and to everybody who was present today and following uh, today's session. Thanks and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.